Good afternoon, everyone. I think this is our first event in the uh, Crystal Room, perhaps. Uh, I'm Danny Warshay. I'm the executive director of the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. And those of you who know me and have been to our events before know you know that I always ask this question. And uh, it is, for how many of you is this your first Nelson Center event? Raise your hand high. Awesome. And I always ask that so that I know who you are and uh, can personally welcome you. It's always great to see uh, old faces as well as some of your new faces. So thank you especially to those of you for whom this is your first event. And uh, in case you don't know, the way you can be informed of all of our future events is to go to our website, which is entrepreneurship.brown.edu and to sign up for our news updates so you'll be in the loop of all the incredible workshops, speakers, events, venture support, courses, all the entrepreneurship resources that our center will provide. So thank you very much. And also, I see a few community members from Beyond Brown. And it's great that you're here, because as you know, uh, all of our events are open to anybody. So not just if you're a member of the Brown community. I thought I would draw your attention to a few events coming up next week that are highlighted on our website. All those events are on our events calendar. Two are affiliated with Family Weekend. One is Chuck Davis, class of 82, is going to have a presentation at this time slot next Friday, and it will be awesome. Chuck is a wonderful longtime supporter of Brown, a uh, serial entrepreneur in his own right, and every time he speaks at Brown, he's very well received. The other, if you don't mind my promoting my own event, is <laughs> that on uh, Saturday, the next day, uh, the 20th of October at 11 o'clock, I'm doing a family weekend forum. Uh, it's my workshop on bottom-up research. And so if you've heard it before, it can be a rerun for you. If you haven't heard it before, it can be an introduction to the first step in the entrepreneurial process that we speak about. Uh, there are other events coming up next week, even before that, on Thursday. And uh, today, by the end of the day, is the last moment uh, for you to sign up for our Boston Synapse Trek, which is an opportunity for a small group of you to go with us to Boston to visit a handful of startups. And in particular, this is a theme that we've done for the last couple of years that you can read about on our website. And uh, if you're interested, though, it is filling up. And so there's only a couple spots left. You should immediately after this go to our website and find a place to register uh, for that synapse. So at this point, I'm really happy to introduce an old friend former student, Abhishek, and it is a little hard to believe, we just recognized it's been uh, nine years almost, eight and a half years, I guess, since you graduated from Brown. I remember the first time I met Abhishek, and even at that point, in our very first meeting, he was incredibly enthusiastic about these little dessert pastries that he shared with me uh, that were common for people in the Netherlands where he is from to eat. And he had a whole vision of about how he was gonna create a company out of Brown that was gonna make these pastries, Stroop waffles, to share with the US public. And I hear a lot of enthusiasm from lots of students and much of that gets channeled into reality and sometimes it doesn't, so you just never know. And so, um, but given how dogged Abhishek was, even those very early days. I remember we met on the stairway in Wilson Hall. And uh, it's not a surprise to me, looking back at that first meeting, that you've done so much with that initial germ of an idea. You were clearly set out to follow the entrepreneurial process that we teach here at Brown. You're such a good indication of the way that works in the real world. And so I'm excited to have Abhishek share his story with us. The way we're going to work this is, I know you have a lot of interest in sharing your insights, asking questions. So Abhishek is going to speak for just a few minutes. And then we're going to tee up questions. The only logistical favor I'll ask is, given the acoustics in here, 
please um, have the mic in hand when you're asking your question. And we hope we can make this, as most of our events are, as interactive as we possibly can. So thank you so much for coming back and sharing the wisdom you've um, accumulated through the years. It gives me a tremendous amount of pride as your former professor to have you here today. So thanks so much. Thanks. Okay. Hello. It works. All right. Hello. Nice to meet you all. Um, it's nice to be back at Brown. I actually, uh, freshman year, lived in this part of campus. <laughs> um, remember this 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 area really well. I actually used to study in Smitty B. I used to uh, climb through the window on the weekends. Um, kind of a little secret at the time, like no one was inside, but you could get through, in through the window so you had the top room to yourself. So some great memories. One of my best friends lived in Andrew. Um, he lived with this boxer guy. And um, they never got in fights, though. So uh, I, I had an amazing time at Brown. Um, and it's so nice to be back. And you know, this, this is really about you guys. You know, I, um, I feel so grateful to have gone here. I was mostly on scholarship uh, at Brown. And I had an amazing time, and I hope you're as well. But really, I'm here today um, to be of service to all of you and um, help you guys in any way during this talk. And so I think my experience might interest you for different reasons. But ultimately, I think there's something deeper here. Um, that I can potentially share with you, and, and hopefully it might uh, spark some further interest, and you'll have some follow-up questions. So as, as Danny mentioned, you know the, the presentation will be pretty short, um, pretty precise uh, and concise. And then, really, let's go into questions. And guys, take this time to really you know, take a chunk out of my leg um, and just ask anything Anything that comes to mind, I'm, I'm, I'm all yours. So, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a thinker, kind of existential, and so you'll <laughs> probably think about, like, why did this guy start making waffles? And we'll get to that in a second. But, you know, if you look at, if you look at this over here, this applies to all of you, right? So you all went to school. Maybe some of you are brilliant and some of you didn't till Brown. But, um, but the point is, is that no matter whether you grew up in Namibia or you know, Long Island, um, you're all here right now in college, right, at Brown. And so the question really is, is what do you want to do at Brown? You know, how do you want to spend your, your four years? And what do you want to do afterwards? And some of you are at the tail end of this, and some of you are just starting. Um, and some of you are in between. But I think this is something I actually really started asking myself um, as a kid, actually in, in kind of in primary school. And my parents are physicists, so they're like, you have to really study. Um, so I basically took the science track in middle and high school and stopped doing anything creative. But as a kid, I was a super kind of curious, creative kid. I loved to make things, like making remote control cars, to pretty artistic as well. But I kind of put the lid on that and then really only started to realize that I can kind of get back in touch with my, my, my childhood passions post-college through entrepreneurship. Um, so really, this is an opportunity to explore how my path might be A, relatable, but B, provide you with, with a stepping stone to determine what you actually want to do after college. So 
I, you know, every now entrepreneurship is a lot bigger, and like there's a lot of investment in, in food, especially consumer packaged goods. Um, there have been a lot of success stories of companies being sold for a lot of money. Um, companies have been grown really quickly, some of them with tech multiples, and it's a pretty sexy space to be in. But when I started, no one wanted to invest in food. If food wasn't sexy. And I, I very much took my own path. I was like, you know, my parents, I was very fortunate, are really passionate about science. And I saw the sparkle in their eye ever since I was a kid. And they're pretty simple people, but they're insanely passionate about what, I, what, what they, they did and what they're doing. And so I thought, well, if I can find that for myself, that would be really awesome. And so what I did was I looked at college as really an opportunity to eliminate things that I thought I was interested in, but wasn't really sure whether I was really passionate about and could do afterwards. And I think kind of from an academic background, I was thinking very much inside of the box. So if you look at freshman year, you know, thinking about studying economics, engineering, you know, I, I took an intro to neuroscience. I was like, holy shit, <laughs> this is epic. Maybe, maybe you want to become a, a surgeon, you know, neurosurgeon. And then I, um, first summer, it's not on here, but I actually uh, shadowed a doctor, uh, a surgeon in India. My, I'm half Indian, my mom's Indian, so our family actually sponsors a hospital there. And so I, I like spent a month uh, almost fainting and like fainting a few times. It's like, that's not for me. Um, and so, you know, I started to realize that I didn't want to do something academic, you know? I, I didn't really see myself becoming a professor. I really tried to become passionate about the things that I, I liked. You know, I was generally pretty good at math. I ended up doing applied math because it kind of was the easiest thing for me. Um, but, you know, I realized that my education was a tool for what I would do afterwards. You know, I didn't want to do a PhD in molecular biology. Um, I actually envied people that did at the time because I was like, holy F, like, I, I wish I was that person. But I, 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 I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and it really, really was irritating. It's kind of an itch you can scratch. And so I was fortunate enough uh, to, you know, uh, sophomore summer get an internship in McKinsey in Amsterdam. It kind of they used the whole you know, Ivy League card, like at a school in, in the US. You know, I'm, I, I know I'm very young, but you should, you should give me a shot. And so um, I was fortunate to do an internship there, and it went really well. They wanted me back. Um, sorry. And then, uh, you know, junior year came back, and, uh, you know, by then I had. You know, a bunch of things were happening in parallel. So freshman year, I brought these waffles over from Holland. And Stroop waffles, I don't know if anyone doesn't know what one is. You don't know? All right. <laughs> I just thought you said you do know. Where, where are the, oh, do we have some boxes? Oh, wow, they're gone. Great. That's a good thing. All right, so in Holland, where I, where I grew up, uh, 320 million of these are consumed. That we only have 16 million people. That's 20 per person per year. <laughs> that is a shitload of, of these waffles. And so I thought, well, you know, there's the Oreo in the US, um, there's the chocolate chip cookie, uh, Chips Ahoy being a dominant force. But this product, hadn't really entered the US market. At least no one had done it successfully. So I was really inspired by Chobani, you know, the story of, of this Turkish guy who brought over Mediterranean yogurt and positioned it in an American way that was sexy and relevant, and that took off. So I wasn't thinking about that at the time, but I brought Stroopwafels from back home, gave them to my friends, and they absolutely loved them. And so fast forwarding to sophomore summer after my McKinsey internship, I actually went to Italy. Um, 
And I, I studied Italian for fun, worked out of a bar, paid for my rent that way. And uh, I started reading. I was really, really bored. Started reading about entrepreneurship. Daddy, I think this was right before I took your class. Um, that's kind of, kind of spark that wanted me to kind of take your class. But essentially, I started reading about like Richard Branson, like all these other entrepreneurs, and I, co I thought I had this aha moment. I was like, "Holy shit! I can actually make something, and if we can sell it for a profit, I can use that profit to make more things." And as a kid, I loved making things, so I found my passion. I want to be an entrepreneur, right? So I had this moment in Italy in the sleepy village. And I was like, there's no looking back. But I, I didn't have the balls at the time. So I was like, well, you know, I did this McKinsey thing, post-financial crisis. Maybe I want to do something in finance. I was an absolute idiot at the time. But, um, but I, I kind of, I was like, OK, well, let me see at least what finance is like. So I was working at Alvers and Marshall. It's a restructuring firm. And they were doing the restructuring at Lehman Brothers at the time in London. I was a part of that team. Amazing experience, got an offer from there as well. But came back and I was like, you know what? Either I actually try and do something with this. So I had, in the meantime, you know, set up a stand on campus, sold the product. And you guys can ask me more about this stuff, but you know, people seem to like it. I mean, you guys will eat anything. That's the reality, right? <laughs> but, uh, but I was convinced that, you know what? I'm going to give up these job offers. I have about $20,000 of savings from like internships and whatnot. I can survive for a year. And let's see. Let me try and do this. And, and then I didn't look back. And basically, I had this strategy where I was like, OK, I have a year. I need to get the business to a point where I can get some funding or I'm able to make enough revenue to continue on but I want to give this a shot. So this is what happened afterwards. Hello. Yeah. OK. So kind of brief summary of this. And I'll, I'll close up, and you guys can ask questions. So when I graduated, you can imagine like being in Providence over the summer. No one's there, right? And. Uh, I, I like bought an industrial waffle iron from Holland. I, was, uh, I, I roomed with a, a, a friend of mine who was two years younger than me. So we paid for the lease that summer. And so I basically stayed in that apartment. And I was like, OK, we need to somehow start this. I need some money right, to, to make more of them, buy more of the equipment, buy more of the ingredients. And so at that time, I had partnered with an with a engineering professor uh, at Brown and, uh, and his kind of team of students to make an automated caramel dispenser, which kind of is, is like a big uh, bottleneck in the production process. So with that, I was able to produce you know, thousands of units uh, a week versus a couple of hundred units a week. So I was able to, if I found a little spot you know, the little commercial kitchen, I was able to produce enough of the product and sell them to local stores and on campus. So I raised 23K on Kickstarter. I hope you haven't seen my Kickstarter video because it's really embarrassing. <laughs> but, uh, but that basically <coughs> kept me going till uh, December, January. Um, and in 2011, I ran out of that 23K. I had some data from the Blue Room and some other places that Rip Van Waffles is selling really well. We're actually the highest selling snack. And the Chobani was the best selling item outside of beverages. And we're number two. So that was really compelling. So at least I had a case study. And, but I was, you know, I, I didn't have, we didn't have any capital. We, you know, still early days in terms of scaling. So I really had to put a business plan together, raise some capital to then scale. And so at the time, I met Marco, my co founder who uh, was still a junior in college. And so since he was still a college student, we could apply for the Brown Business Plan competition. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't totally fair because you know we, uh, I guess, had a head start. But that worked to our advantage and were able to win the business plan competition. We 
we, I think one, it's a 50K prize at the time, but most of it was in cash. So I think we ended up with like 15K. And so we used that to actually design the initial packaging, find a co-packer and run an additional production run. And then we were able to raise uh, some capital uh, from family and friends. And we actually ran on that capital for two years, um, selling to like local universities. And then after that, we, we well, there are many low points in the startup, but um, one of them was when we were kind of hanging on the string. Uh, we, we've done around 200K in revenue, which is very little. And we're trying to figure out, okay, well, we don't have a distributor. We're selling to these colleges. We're not sure whether we have the right pack size or the right product format. How do we scale this business without diluting ourselves out of the company? Right? Because when you take on capital, you have to give up equity, especially at that stage. And so what we realized was that one of our customers was a, a biotech company actually in Boston through a distributor where we just started working with. And they were, they were buying five cases of Rip Van Waffles a week. And we called them up. We we're like, why the hell are you buying so many Rip Van Waffles? And they said, well, it's the perfect treat in the mid-afternoon. And we're like, huh, so maybe this will also work in Silicon Valley because a lot of tech companies after Google start to basically give snacks for free to their employees. And so what I did was my little brother, the smarter of us two, was an undergrad at Stanford. And uh, I basically crashed on his couch for a month. And we basically kind of before the 900K capital raise, uh, I visited 80 tech companies door to door and finally got into Square. And, uh, and that actually wasn't a cold call. It was a friend of mine who was a year junior to me at Brown, who was like the 100th employee at Square at the time. She's like, you know, come visit me. Here's the food person. And they started ordering. Literally within a couple of weeks, they're ordering like 20 cases a week. And so then they introduced us to their distributor that then brought our product into some other tech companies. And then with that distributor on board, we're able to reach a lot more of their customers. And then literally we'd made you know, 200K over a couple of months. And we're like, wow, this is really working. And so we had a you know, more robust business plan and a, a plan to scale the business. And at that time, we had raised around 900K from a bunch of angels, like 20K to the occasional 100K check. It was really hard to raise this, but we did it. And then that's when we kind of used that success story to get into Pete's. We got into Google, so they're removing 20, 30,000 units per month of our product. And then the following year, we got into Whole Foods, we got into more tech companies. And then beginning of 2016, we got into 12,000 Starbucks nationwide. And then we're like, holy shit, this is our moment, right? Like, we've, we've made it. So uh, we're like, you know, it's, everything's going to be fine. Uh, we're going to set up our own factory. You know, we're going to go gangbusters. We hire all the wrong people. Uh, the factory we buy turns out to be a lemon. It doesn't work. The moment we place the factory in the facility, it essentially start operating if the entire thing catches on fire. Uh, we lose a million dollars because our margins go to shit. We're losing on every single unit we're selling. So you basically lost, I think at one point, $1.5 million in a month, um, which we miraculously recovered from because right before that, we raised $2 million. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so basically, during that time, you know, we're doing around $4 million in sales. Uh, there's a lot of demand, but we can't fulfill it. Uh, we can barely fulfill Starbucks. And so, but luckily, a long stream of events, our previous co-packer, they can't set up a production line, a larger one, because they wanted to expand. 
because we had an exclusivity to all of North America for Stroopwafel production lines with this manufacturer that kind of screwed us, I guess. Um, so we negotiated a really good deal with them to actually go back to them and essentially at the same cost as if we set up our own production line. And so now we have 4.5 million units per month of capacity. We just got into Costco in the Bay Area and we're about to fly again. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's pretty much that. You know, there's a lot of innovation that that took place during that time. And I think I got a lot of clarity and so did Marco about what we wanted to do. And I think this, this is really important because um, in the beginning it's about survival. You know, can an idea work or can you get a certain job or can you get into a certain school? But then you kind of start thinking about, well, why? Why does it matter? And so I think having gone through so many ups and downs over the last almost a decade, I realized that I'm gonna die anyway. <laughs> and uh, if I'm not doing something that's impactful to other people, then I might be enjoying it, but it's kind of like mental masturbation, right? So I was like, well, if we can, through our products, have a little bit of an impact in some way, then I think we can feel better about what we're doing. And if we can do that beyond the waffle, you know, uh, with the waffle and beyond the waffle, that would be really cool. And so I think that's when kind of our mission really became clear beyond kind of making Rip Van Waffles the, the next Oreo in the US or Chobani. Um, and the mission was to essentially improve people's lives by creating better convenient foods. Um, and we put our money where our mouth is because we actually started to reinvent the waffle every two years. So when we started the company, this product had 14 grams of sugar. Now it has eight to nine, and beginning of next year, it'll only have three grams of sugar. Um, and we've also developed a protein version, which has better nutritionals than a Kind Bar and a Cliff Bar that's launching beginning of next year. We're launching one gram sugar minis. Um, and then we're actually going beyond. So you can take the same technology and create a, a healthier Pop-Tart, right? And so on. Uh, so that's, next year is actually really exciting from an innovation standpoint. It just took a little while to, to get there. Um, now, this is my journey, right? But Really, it's about you guys. So the question is, how can I help you with the limited experience I have to help you figure out what the heck you want to do when you graduate, right? This is what this conversation is really about. Some of you are interested in entrepreneurship. Some of you are interested in other things. But I think this conversation, the questions uh, that will be asked, hopefully will kind of spur some thought and uh, help you along the way. So thank you. And uh, yeah, let's do it. So whoever wants to talk needs the mic, right? Thank you. Um, did you have an advisor starting out, and how important was that if you did? And also, if you did, how do you look for advisors, or where do you find them? Specifically for? For like a business plan type got it, thing. Got it, got it. So actually, Danny was the first one to advise me. And he was like, why the hell are you doing this? <laughs> he said, you know, we, um, you know, in, in his class, you know, part of, I mean, you, a lot of you probably know this, and you can speak a lot better to this than me. But part of the class requires you to basically put a business plan together, right? And essentially test an idea to some extent. Perhaps it's evolved a little bit since. But um, so he, he wanted me to think bigger. And he wanted me to think, uh, you know, 
he wanted me to critically think things through. And he wanted to, he basically warned me, he's like, dude, this is really hard. And you want to make sure that you put yourself in the best position post-college. And so I think, so I'll answer your question. So that's, you know, that I guess he advised me for the first time. But I think I, I had a gut feeling. It sounds kind of very cliche and, and silly, but I really thought that since this is such a popular product back home, and since it's the number one sold item in Schiphol, which is our, our international airport in Amsterdam, this must have legs in the US. And I just love this product so much. I'm not going to listen to anyone. I'm going to see where this goes. Um, but I think along the way, you know, which was kind of foolhardy because it could have horribly failed, right? But um, I had a, so besides Danny giving me some advice, I had, a, you know, Barrett Hazeltine spoke to him a bunch. Um, I think Barrett Hazeltine's a yes man. And that gives you a lot of self-confidence when uh, everyone around you is like, why the F are you making waffles, dude? You just gave up a job in McKinsey, you know? Um, but yeah, I think, I think, so Barrett, and there's this other guy called uh, Misha Joukowsky, who used to live in, uh, in Providence, and I think now lives in South, North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, he's, a, he's a Brown alum. And he has a, a family office. He's an investor. And he gave me a bunch of advice. And then uh, John O'Shea, the, the chef at Brown, uh, he helped us get into some other, um, other colleges. And I think that was about it at the time. Um, and it wasn't really till I think we were doing this in a little bit of a vacuum. And I think that's one of the things that we should have probably done differently is surrounded ourselves with more people that could help us, people that had gone our path, right? Uh, or people that have had extensive experience in the industry that we're getting ourselves into. That proved to be very helpful, you know? We just brought on board the uh, ex-CEO of a company called Blue Buffalo. So a pet food company that just got sold to General Mills for $8 billion. Um, he's been super helpful. Um, we had the ex-CEO of Cliff Bar as an advisor for a long time. She was in instrumental. You know, basically, when you have people like that, they're, they're able to prevent you, I guess, from falling into potholes, right? Um, so yeah, I mean. I think also when you're in college, right, people really are willing to listen to you. And it's amazing how much you actually can learn by reaching out and being a little fearless. And so really use the, that opportunity. Really use college to kind of reach out to people that you think would never respond, you know, whether it's alumni or not alumni. I think it's a great opportunity because the more of that you have, um, the better prepared you'll definitely be. And they'll also help you think more critically and strategically within that domain. They also might be full of crap sometimes. So you have to really think for yourself. But yeah. Please. Uh, Mike. By the way, would you guys mind uh, saying your names? OK. Yeah. My name's Mark Dirksen. And like a little bit about yourself as well? Uh, I'm a, I work here at staff as look over the radiation safety program. But I had a question about reducing your sugar content from 12 grams down to 3. And 14 down to 3. 14 down to 3. And yeah. how are you going to convince your customers that that's a good thing based on so many other companies out there going the other way, promote more sugar in their products. Because it just seems like there's, we, we're in a society where, say, clinicians and pharmaceuticals will say, take that lifestyle and we'll give you a pill, and you don't have to change it. But you're trying to change 
a lifestyle by reducing your sugar. So I find that interesting and in how are you going, it seems like it's an uphill battle, but I don't know that you're. So I think underlying your question, it's like a very interesting topic of conversation, which is how do you decide what to innovate, right? I mean, I think listening, and Danny talks about this a lot, but like really understanding where the market is going and who your consumer is, uh, is incredibly important, right? And I think if you look at who that is for Rip Van Waffles, it's the, it's, it's the educated millennial um, that works in, you know, for a minute, basically an educated millennial, right? Um, pretty broad. That's kind of the core, core audience. And if you kind of look at what they care about right now, sugar is like, low sugar is like a very hot thing. Um, so, you know, if you look at, for example, a Cliff Bar, right? Uh, a Cliff Bar has over 20 grams of sugar. Um, but a lot of people don't know that because what they call out is organic, right? And that they're sustained energy. And so a lot of the product success is based on the positioning of the product, right? So if if you look at, I mean, there's some really good examples out there. If you look at uh, Chobani, they promoted the 0% fat at the time, which was a big thing. So our industry is very, very fatty. Fat, not, haha. <laughs> um, but it, there are a lot of fads and there are a lot of trends. And so if you're able to resonate with those in, in a way that is authentic where like it's pretty clear that sugar is not good for you. It's actually one of the worst things, especially refined sugar. So if you lower that, right, that's generally a good thing. I think the the definition around health and healthy eating isn't defined from first principles. And so the World Health Organization has a different definition. The FDA has a different definition. It's a pretty gray area. There's certain things with like research recently that are pretty clear. So I think one thing that's important to us, irrespective of positioning, is let's try and be honest, right? But that, let's also try and be smart and let's try and position ourselves in a way that resonates with what people want. I think the overlap of the two for an indulgent product like this is sugar. And if you can basically have something that's as indulgent as a Snickers or an Oreo, but you're having an order of magnitude less sugar, that's awesome, right? That's like, that, that's replacing something that's actually not very good for you with something that's less bad for you, right? So, yeah, so I, I don't think it's a problem for us. I think it's actually a, a big strength for our target audience. But I think more broadly, it's about understanding that consumer, understanding what resonates with them, um, and basically testing that out before you actually go ahead and launch that. That's where the kind of the rapid prototyping model, right, is, is really effective for finding product market fit, what, what they call product market fit. Uh, you in the red sweater, what's your name? Hi, um, my name is Elvia Perez. Nice and to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, and I just want to first thank you for taking the time out of your day to come here and like speak to us. I, fa I found what you had to say very like inspirational and very insightful. So thank you so much. And um, so My I had- My pleasure. In <laughs> fact, actually, you should be thanking me because I drove up here, Danny. <laughs> and I was actually, I had two EAs on the phone and um, I got a ton of work done because they were basically sending my emails for me, but I could barely see, right? And I was driving, like, I like driving fast, which is not a good thing. But it was raining cats and dogs, but besides that, you don't have to thank me. My pleasure. <laughs> So what's the juicy question? Um, so I had um, two questions for you, if that's OK. So the first one would be, if you had the opportunity to redo your undergrad years here at Brown, what would you have done differently? 
And then the second one is, um, I know you've overcome so many obstacles in your career, and I was wondering what's the most important thing you've learned from overcoming those obstacles? Okay. Uh, both very hard questions. So I will, I can't speak to the full question, but I'll kind of nibble away at what I can. Um, I would say, like, think, like, these four years go by really quickly. And it's, it's an amazing time to, to do a lot of different things, but I think being incredibly strategic and incredibly thoughtful about this period where you're, I don't mean to like scare you guys away or like freak you guys out, but did you only have four effing years of college? And you like you better you better make the most out of it. And you need to understand what that definition is for you, and you need to live up to achieving the goal of that definition. Because if you don't, you're basically pissing your time away, right? So I think I think what's really important strategically is to like actually take some time and not listen to other people. Just take some time, go to a place that's really boring and just think, read and reflect and try and like look within and ask yourself, okay, what am I curious about, right? I think that's super important. So if you do that early on in college, I think that's a huge advantage because you can actually prepare yourself and craft how you allocate your time in college in a way that can prepare you for whatever that goal is. Now, it might end up being that that goal isn't ultimately what you want to do, but you're being thoughtful, and I think that's the point, because that is a great principle to apply for personal growth, right? And so if it's not the thing, ultimately, and that thing might be evolving, or you might be kind of like me, which I'm like, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur for like 20 years, right? The point is, is that seeking process will keep you even keel, and when you look back, you'll be like, holy shit, I had an epic time. And in the end of the day, I mean, that's what matters, right? So I think that's one. I think number two, uh, what have I learned from overcoming obstacles? You know what was really inspiring uh, for me was reading, uh, before Ray Dalio, who's a famous hedge fund guy, um, wrote the book called Principles, he actually had a kind of life philosophy document where he has kind of his principles on life and kind of his principles in business. And it was a free document. I think it's still free, but he's trying to sell his book now. Um, <laughs> So you can find it online somewhere, but that really helped me think. It gave me a very different perspective of how to think for myself. Because I think the, the thing about college and high school and primary school that's really, really bad is that you kind of, it depends what schooling you've had, but like you kind of have to learn by the book and you're not really thinking critically from first principles in a practical way for yourself. I think that really helped me do that. So I think overcoming obstacles helped me become more resilient because like when you, I guess, I, I don't work out, but figuratively, you know, <laughs> when you like build a muscle, right, you can become better at overcoming obstacles. Um, but I think it, it taught me that an obstacle is just an obstacle. It's not positive or negative, it's just a thing in your way. And I think the key thing is to understand how you can get around that thing, right? And we, we kind of sometimes, when you have a failure or setback, feel really bad and our ego gets bruised. But the point is if you can detach yourself from what it is you're confronting and figure out as objectively as possible how you can get around that, that's how you grow, right? So I don't know if that, that helps, but. Yeah, thank you so much. Cool. So yeah, I, I highly recommend you guys reading this if you haven't already. Ray Dahlia's Principles, it's really interesting. You and then you behind? Hi, um, What's your name? I'm Anya. 
Let's let's like uh, get more more details now. What year are you? Is it working? Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Anya. I'm a freshman here at Brown. Um, thank and you. And where for your where time. are you from? I'm from the Bay Area, California. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask. So I know you mentioned that you admired how Chobani was able to like almost Americanize their like yogurt product that had like foreign origins. Biggest, so just, they're the biggest yogurt company in the country now. Yeah. So yeah. I wanted to ask how like initially you figured out how to frame your product in a way that kind of like got past the barrier that Stroop waffles are were relatively unfamiliar in America and like convinced people in the US that your product was something that they needed. Yeah, so um, that took a while. Um, I think it was when we started to really listen to consumers. Um, so we did a bunch of focus groups. So we, had, we created a product, and they were like, oh, maybe we should do this to it or that to it, right? But we were like, hold on. Let's talk to the people that are eating our product, and let's listen to them. Let's try and infer what they like about it and what they don't like about it. And then let's eliminate the stuff they don't like about it and like add the stuff they like about it, right? Um, and so I think part of that's the actual product itself, right? The taste, the texture, um, the make of it. But a big part of it also is the packaging, right? So with a physical products company, if you don't have any money to market, the packaging's the marketing, right? It's on the front and the back. And so Again, by, like, by putting out an idea of the packaging, understanding what the FDA allows you to call out on the front from a health claim standpoint, and then on the back as well, you basically test these things, see what resonates, and then based on what resonates, you make the mo those modifications. So yeah, I think once we figured that out, you know, it actually improved sales substantially. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I know some of you have to leave for a uh, one o'clock class, which is of course perfectly fine. I thought I would at least pause and ask everybody to thank Abhishek for being with us today. Thank you for braving the uh, elements to drive talking to two people on the phone doing your emails. I'm not sure I would have advocated that, but uh, loud, hands free. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Happy to hear that. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'll recommend that, again, if you're interested in more of these kinds of events, you go to entrepreneurship.brown.edu and sign up for our email updates. If you have to leave, no offense taken, but I think you're willing to stay around for a few more yeah, minutes. Sure. And so um, if you're staying, we'll pause. If you have to leave, if you're staying, just move up, and then we'll have this in a little bit more of an intimate setting. So we'll just pause for a second. So if you're staying, just move up, and we'll have time for just a couple more questions. Okay, uh, who else, even in this less expansive setting? Good. Hi, uh, my name is Taegon, Taegon Lee, and I'm actually a recent grad from RISI. Nice. And um, I'm also a founder of company TurboBox, an online launch marketplace for corporate employees. And my team includes um, alums from RISD, Johnson & Wales, and Brown University as well. And my question is about you know, a more of a technical question, uh, aside from, uh, from like school stuff. Um, and my question is, like, um, in terms of like, process, like, what was your like, overall, overall like, um, 
process? Like, how did you approach angel investors? Like, and what was your technique? Um, did you have your like own personal like from your experience that you developed over time? You know, like how to pitch investors and how were you able to get a check from them? And did you meet them like several times, or did you um, get the check from from the first meeting? Things like that. So basically, how to raise money? Yes. <laughs> okay. Especially from angel investors. Got it. So, um, so our strategy was to focus on the people we knew well, um, develop relationships with them, um, and develop relationships with their immediate network. So our first round of funding came from family and friends. And so it's talking to people that know you really well, um, that essentially are advocates for you, that then convince the people around them who have disposable capital to invest in you. So I think there are two parts to your question. One part is how do you attract and who do you attract? And the second part is um, how do you actually like value the deal and like logistically get it done. Um, so I think for the first part is exactly that. It's like being hyper-focused um, and not like spreading yourself too thin. Because it, it can be an exhausting amount of time and most people are not gonna invest in like an idea out of college, right? Um, I would say the second part really has to do with people who have done this before. So I mean there's there's a lot of stuff around this. Like, how do you value a company? Like, if you go to YC, you'll see some heuristics they use, some principles they use for evaluation. There are different ways of valuing a company. You can delay that by, you know, doing convertible debt versus straight up equity. Danny Warshay can give you a lot of advice about this. Um, but yeah, I think it really depends on your type of business as well. And a lot of this information is online. Yeah, you can look it up. And I think using kind of best practices for your industry and then putting a deck together, kind of showing kind of a business plan, a growth story, um, even though most of it's probably BS, um, will, I guess, for some investors, uh, give them the confidence that you've like really thought through what you're thinking of doing, at least. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's the answer to part two. Was there anyone that you reached um, through like the primary people financial or not probably like the channel? So angel list didn't exist actually. Uh, uh, yeah, so it was really the um, and there there weren't even a lot of like online groups. It was mostly as I guess what I did was I like went through the Brown Alumni Network. I just like initially just started, started calling people. But uh, after a while I realized that, that didn't really work very well. So it's like going after people that you know and really focusing on that. And you might have like a friend who has like a wealthy uncle who like likes your friend a lot and you know, and you get to know that wealthy uncle and you're like, come on, give us a shot. It's gonna be huge, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. Hold on. Oh. document. Once you know, um, once you knew that this is what you wanted to do, so about maybe junior year or you know sophomore junior year, did you start to change the courses that you took to shape like around your entrepreneurial visions? I tried. Well, I, I was doing applied math econ, so I had to like finish like my major requirements. And then outside of that, it was like, okay, well, what classes can I take that require little horsepower? Um, so for sure, I was like trying to figure out how I could allocate more time to this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Vivian. I'm from Mississippi. Uh, I'm into like food and nutrition, and you mentioned that you're trying to reduce the sugar in, uh, to like three grams. So what are you replacing that? Because I'm assuming you're going to keep the same taste. How are you replacing that uh, taste? 
It's a lot of weird, no, kidding. <laughs> um, so we're using actually a chic chicory root fiber that has the same properties of uh, tapioca, which is our current filling, kind of a nice chewy caramelly filling, but is, is, it's much more nutritious. So it's, it's more expensive as well. I mean, that's a problem with a lot of these effective ingredients is that they drive up cost, which kind of is inhibitive for your business model. I think with economies of scale, we're able to get over that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's that one ingredient that's making a big difference for us. So that the glucose in the tapioca has you know, pretty high carb and very low fiber and also has a decent amount of sugar. So if you replace that one for one, you're actually able to make the product a lot more nutritious, which is awesome. Second thing we're doing is we're actually doing a mix of monk fruit and, and cane sugar versus just having cane sugar. And what's interesting about monk fruit is that it's a much more, it's much more sweet for per volume than sugar is. So by adding some monk fruit and take away sugar, you can actually use a fraction of the sugar that you'd use otherwise. So. Um, I'm Shreya, I'm a senior from Los Angeles. Um, I was curious to know if you've like considered introducing this product back to the Netherlands. Like, How do you think it would do there, given that they're familiar with the nature of the product, but they might be interested in the other features that seem to be like really appealing to the Americans? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of things that are very successful in the US end up going everywhere. Um, so I think there will be potential for that in the future. I think two, two things that are important, I think. One is focus is really important. You know, when you have limited resources and this market's so big. So our major focus is the US. I mean, you can grow our business to 50 million plus in sales, just focusing on the US, or even double that. Um, and have, not, not even have, uh, I guess, covered most of the market across different channels. Um, so I think that's the kind of the strategic answer. I think that, uh, you know, in terms of going abroad, you know, the different markets are different, right? And I think what's interesting about the Dutch market is this product's very much a, a, a commodity. So, you know, you could buy a pack of 10 for 89 euro sets, right? While we sell one for 179. 149 to 179. So, you know, unless you have a like very strong brand and uh, you have a lot of marketing dollars behind your product, even if it's significantly more nutritious, that's a requirement to compete in that market. So I think it would be quite some time before that, that'll happen. Yeah. Maybe you have time for one or maybe two more questions. Hi, I'm Jasmine, and I'm a freshman here at Brown. So you told me the story of how you went abroad to Italy, and then during that time, you kind of really got into entrepreneurship. So after coming back to Brown, what did you do while you still have that one last year here at Brown? What? I took his lovely class. Yeah. <laughs> I highly recommend. Anything besides that? Do you feel like studying here at Brown, like the last year at Brown, really helped you pursue your journey in entrepreneurship? I think entrepreneurship at Brown's gotten a lot better. Um, I think there are a lot fewer people interested in entrepreneurship at that time, uh -huh. which actually was also in some way an advantage because you know, there are more people willing to listen to you, right? If there are 20 people trying to start a company versus like three people trying to start a company, that's an advantage there. But there are less like established resources mm -hmm. at the university. So I think it was kind of a lone wolf path. Okay. I was like, okay, I need to figure this out. Um, so I would say not strategically. It didn't help at the time that much. I'd say what really did help, which I think is unique at Brown, is that you have a lot of space, right? And you have a lot of time to do stuff. And you have a lot of time to think. Mm -hmm. And because there's no core curriculum, the flexibility you have here is, is that much more. So I think it is an amazing test ground to kind of rapidly iterate 
make mistakes, right? Because you, you have that time. And the clock's kind of on pause a little bit. So in terms of courses, you didn't really do anything. You just um, put more effort outside. Well, I, I took da Danny's class. Uh -huh. uh, I took Engine 9. Uh -huh. uh, and, and then uh, this section of Engine 9, uh, Tchaikovsky's section was really good. So there's a TA that was like really into entrepreneurship, just like Danny is. Mm -hmm. And has a lot, has a decent amount of experience investing in companies. I think that helped a lot. So I did seek out their resources on campus at the time. But there's a, a lot of soul searching as well. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll have you um, yeah, ask a question, but I can't resist the prerogative of holding the microphone. Uh, because I think now, nine years later, what's relevant also for your question, and maybe others of you, is, OK, now what are the resources that are available? And we now have, as you know, we're sponsoring today the Center for Entrepreneurship. And the way we describe our resources is briefly in three buckets. One is, as you've said a few times, we teach courses in entrepreneurship. I teach Engine 1010 still. There are now five sections of it. Um, Baird Hazeltine, and now collaborating with Thano Chaltis, teaches Engine 9 and 90 still. But if you go to our website, you'll see a tab called Courses. It lists those two, and it lists about 30 other courses, many of which didn't exist in your day, some of which did, across the whole curriculum that have focused um, interest in entrepreneurship. So there's one on music, there's one on uh, art, there's biotech, there's all sorts of economics, engineering, sociology courses. More than ever, there's a groundswell of academic curricular resources. The second component is what you're all experiencing right now, which is co-curricular resources. Really great opportunities, I think today is a good example, of learning outside the classroom. So virtually every week, we have speakers, maybe not quite as the caliber of, uh, of Abhishek, but we have speakers, we have mentors, we have people doing office hours, holding round tables like you're doing at 2 o'clock. You could spend an enormous amount of time outside the classroom learning in all sorts of ways. And then the third, which is maybe exactly what you're asking, is where we provide resources that teach you not only about entrepreneurship, but they empower you to do it. So if in your day, um, these didn't exist, but if you were today, you could apply for grant funding. We provide a few hundred dollars. You would have been a recipient of an Explore grant, and then you prove something, you come back to us, and we'll provide you up to $2,500, an Expand grant. You would have been a perfect candidate to apply to our summer accelerator called B-Lab. You would have been a great entrant to our Brown Venture Prize competition, which awards $50,000, similar to what you one, but it's actually cash, not designed, <laughs> not disguised winnings, it's actual cash. Uh, and then if you had chosen to um, plant some roots here and grow your company in Rhode Island, you would be eligible for a $50,000 grant from us and the Slater Funds to commit to starting your company and growing it here. We have 300 alumni who are now actively engaged in providing mentorship and other kinds of active uh, venture resources. We make specific connections for you to other resources beyond Brown. We have um, Arnell Millhouse here who represents uh, community organizations that are very actively involved in what we're doing locally. And then to alumni and other functional and investor resources all over the world so that you don't fall off a cliff when you graduate and leave College Hill. So I couldn't resist the opportunity to advertise a little bit of what we're doing, especially for those of you who are maybe first years and don't know, and also to give a little bit of uh, emphasis to what you said, which was, in your day, some of this kind of existed. The EP student-led group did, uh, but more than ever, they are providing peer-based resources and are uh, woven into the fabric of what we do at the center. So I hope that's useful. Yes, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. Samani and uh, Manny are, are good about reminding me that. We have a whole crew of what we call peer entrepreneurs in residence. And they are, like the two of you, really good at um, understanding the process we teach. And then as peers, engaging with you to provide some early mentorship when you're just getting started. And sometimes it feels a little bit more comfortable to speak to somebody who's a fellow student than to come to somebody on our staff or a professor or a, 
an alum. So all of that is available, entrepreneurship.brown.edu. Why don't we take, <laughs> how's that? Why don't we take uh, one more question as a way to close? Yes, I saw your hand. Hi, my name is Jan. I'm a sophomore at Brown. And uh, you talked a little bit about the opportunity that entrepreneurship provides in terms of like making a certain profit on this venture and then using that to make an impact somewhere else. And you talked a little about the, well, the opportunity for impact that this um, business uh, offers in terms of you know, who knows what else will happen with this. And um, I was, my question is, when do you think is the right time to start thinking about um, additional, like these, these additional impacts that you can, you can pursue with uh, your venture? And is it, is, it, is it reasonable to start out uh, trying to think of you know, working on the business and doing these other things simultaneously? Or is it better to just go all out on, on the startup and then think about you know, maybe a few years down the road, what can I do with this? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? I think it really depends on how you define impact. Um, so I think the first step is before you even go down that rabbit hole, is just like try to have a definition. And so if your definition is to, you know, in, in, increase lifespan, right? That I would say, you know, work at a longevity uh, startup or you know, do a PhD in like something that really isn't within that field. Um, so you can make a fundamental contribution, hopefully. Um, or if you're more of the investor type, try and get into like biotech investing, right? So I think it really depends on what it is you want to do. But I think once you figure out what it is you want to do, I think trying to figure out a way to do it and make a living out of it would be the ideal thing. And so my philosophy is like, don't delay what you know you want to do if you're lucky enough to know what you want to do. So, yeah. I don't want to deprive you of the question you had. Do you want to ask or do you want to just come up after? That's fine. OK. So uh, thank you all for coming, staying. Uh, thank you again, Abhishek. Really appreciate all your participation. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure. Thank you. Great.